two, which is safety legislation and regulations. Um, so first of all, what are legislation? What is an act and what is a regulation? So legislation is a law that is passed by a legislative body uh, such as a parliament or a state uh, legislature. So uh, it's passed by a, a badan perundangan, okay, legislative body. So a law is considered to be an act when it has already been duly passed by a legislative, uh, legislative body so that law can become an act. So when uh, that law become an act, then you can have regulations. So regulations is one that is approved by groups of individuals based on that act that has already been passed. So you have the act that, uh, that's been passed by the parliament and based on that act, so all these uh, like the departments or bodies or agencies can uh, have regulations based on that act. So the regulations um, uh, serves as a means to make that act a lot easier to follow and and it's also a lot easier to adhere to so for this reason one act it's 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 it can be it's a general act and it can have numerous regulations under it based on its uh, application okay uh let's go back to the evolution of occupational safety and health legislation uh, it's um, the uh, OSH legislation in Malaysia was based on the traditional approach that was derived from the 19th century British legislation. So um, it started in the Industrial Revolution um, in Britain. So the Industrial Revolution in Britain resulted in some unsafe and unhealthy working conditions. And there were also a high numbers of injury and disease. If you look at this uh, picture here on the right, you can see you have all these uh, huge machineries uh, at that time. And the machineries were uh, operated by people who are obviously, these are unskilled workers. They are underage, they are children. And not just that, uh, Look at this boy. He's not even wearing any shoes. He's probably poor. He needs the job. Okay. He's not wearing shoes. He's wearing shorts on the job. And he's handling these. Uh, this looks like a very huge machine. If you look at this belt here, that's a huge belt. So that's an, a moving equipment. And he has his bare hands on the machine. So he is in such a huge risk um, uh, uh, and he can be in an accident any time. Um, so, so due to this, um, the legislation to overcome the problem was introduced slowly. And what uh, they started was in 1844, they uh, had a specific safety provisions which address the fencing of dangerous machineries. So any dangerous machineries will have to have a closure of a guard, like a safeguard, for, for, uh, so that people don't go near it. So that's how it started. And then later, in later part of the 19th century, they had an act that extended the safety positions to men and to other industries and hazards. So not just previously, they were just protecting all defending the dangerous machinery, it's just kind of like just protecting the machine. So, and then after that, then they start to uh, extend the safety to the men itself, okay? And also to other types of industries and hazards, so not just to machineries. And in 1972, um, a British report, which was chaired by Lord Robins, so this report is uh, known as the Robins Report, okay? So it was prepared. And uh, what the Robin report uh, has is that um, um, it um, they had some major recommendations. Okay, so that's uh, Lord Robins. 
And one of it is, it says that there should be more self-regulation by employers and employees. So that means um, the, uh, the, the company itself must have their own uh, regulation. Okay, so have a self-regulation. For example, they should have their own safety and health officers and they should have their own safety and health committees. Okay? It's not that it should be from a department or from a ministry, but it has to be from the organization itself. Okay? They, they need to have their own OSH department. And then there should be a single comprehensive act dealing with occupational safety and health that should contain a clear statement of the basic principles of the safety and, and responsibility of the employers, the employees, and the manufacturers. And this is based on the common law. So, so there should be this act on OSH. And that act shall be supported by regulations and voluntary codes with emphasis on the leader. Now, in Malaysia, the Occupational Safety and Health Act reflects many of the principles that were stated in the British report in 1972. Um, in 1967, this is something that we have covered uh, in our, our, first, uh, our first meeting. So we had the Factory and Machinery Act that was enacted and approved by the Parliament of Malaysia. So back in 1967, uh, uh, it's uh, 10 years after um, our independence. And then in 1970, the Factory and Machinery Act had eight regulations under the Act and it was enforced. And this Act was legislated to overcome the weaknesses in the Machinery Ordinance in 1953. So pre independence we had the machinery ordinance this was during the uh, the heights of uh, tin mining so the machinery ordinance was uh, more focused on uh, steam engine it was more focused on the machinery itself especially in tin mining um, industry and then the workers were not really protected if they work in workplace that doesn't use machinery. So, uh, and then other, and let's say other than mining, other uh, in other, or even in mining itself, okay, even in the mining industry itself, if there is a worker that doesn't really use the machinery, let's say the person is just um, a person who carries who is just somebody who is a labor who carries stuff or that who, who use manual uh, manual equipment. So that person is not protected under the act. So in 1994, this is when um, uh, people start to realize the importance of occupational health and safety. Uh, it's important to protect other people, other workers who don't really operate machineries. So this legislation was made considering the fact that the FMA in 1967 only covers safety and health in limited industries, which are manufacturing, mining, quarrying, and construction industries. So if you're working in other types of industries, let's say you're in a fishery industry or you're in agriculture, even though you use all those machineries, right? You're not protected under the FMA 1967. So the Occupational Safety and Health Act in 1994 protects people in uh, the other industries. Okay. So the purpose of OSHA is to promote and encourage occupational safety and health awareness among all employers and its workers. So let's look at the main principles that uh, was taken as the foundation in drafting of this act. So the first one is self-regulation. Just like in the Robins report, uh, they recommend to have self-regulation. Same thing here. So to handle issues 
relating occupational safety and health, all employers must develop a good and orderly management system. So they must have a good safety plan. They must have a good safety management system. So starting with the, with the formation of a safety and health policy, and then consequently the employers have to make proper arrangements to be carried out. So you have for first, you have to have a policy about safety. Once you have a policy of the safety, then you have to carry out the things according to that policy and you have to make those arrangements. And then the second element uh, is the tripartite consultation. So it's important to have um, communications between uh, these three parties, the employers, the employees, as well as the government. So they have to talk to each other and negotiate if an issues arise. If there's a problem relating to occupational safety and health at the workplace, so these three, uh, 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 these three, uh, what do you call bodies have to work together. The bosses, the workers, the government, they have to work together to solve or settle that issue. And then the third element is cooperation. Again, there must be good communication. There must be teamwork between the workers and the employees to take care, to nurture, and to increase the quality of occupational safety and health at the workplace. Because without the cooperation or without teamwork between the boss and the workers, you will not have uh, a successful occupational safety and health programs. Because um, if uh, information were not uh, sent, from the workers to the bosses. So you cannot expect the boss to know what is going on or what is lacking uh, in the workplace. Okay? And then the same thing also, if the management comes out with a new safety policy, it won't work if the information is not sent to the workers. So there have to be a good communication system between the two parties, okay, cooperation. Okay, so now OSHA, uh, Occupational Safety and Health Act 1984, is applied to almost all industries. So not just the manufacturing, mining, pouring, and construction. Uh, and construction. So now it also covers people who are in the agriculture, people who are in forestry. Let's say you are a botanist or you are a forest ranger. You go to the forest. Yeah, of course you don't operate machineries, but then. There are risks in the forest. So OSHA also covers forestry work. It also covers fishing. People who go to the ocean, to the sea, to fish, they are, they are covered under the act. And then uh, people are working at utilities such as electricity, okay? Tenaga National, uh, gas, water, such as uh, uh, Indah Water or Ayin Shabas, I Slangor, which uh, people in Slangor have been always having problem with. Sanitary services. And then uh, if you're in the transport industry, uh, if you're a, a truck driver, for example, or if you're a cargo plane uh, pilot, if you're in a storage industry or communication, such as um, or telecommunication, such a working for um, uh, what do you call internet providers, uh, phone companies. If you're in wholesale and retail trades, okay, even if you're uh, a, bit, uh, a seller who sells things, if you're in a hotel industry or restaurant, okay, so this is hospitality and food and beverage industry, you are also uh, applied under OSHA 1994. Uh, and if you work in banks, if you're in, in banking, in, under finance, insurance companies, real estate, any other business services, okay, laws, okay, statu statutory authorities, if you're a lawyer, a judge, if you're in public service, I see you're working for the government, you're also um, protected under OSHA, OSHA 1994. Okay, but there is an exception. 
are people who works in ships or in armed forces, uh, the OSHA doesn't apply to them. So not applicable if you're working on board ships it's because the board ships are governed by the Merchant Shipping Ordinance 1952 and the Merchant Shipping Ordinance 1960 of Sabah and Sarawak. Okay? And not also for armed forces, if you're in the military, if you're in the army or if you're in the navy, um, you're not uh, uh, under OSHA, you have your own uh, act. And this law is in addition to previous law pertaining to occupational safety and health. If there is any conflict, this law shall supersede the previous previous law. Okay, okay so uh, let's now look at the differences between the Factories uh, Machinery Act 1967 and the Occupational Safety and Health Act 1984. So let's see what are the major differences between FMA and OSHA. So first of all, uh, for FMA, um, it it covers limited industries. So it was only concerned with the machineries in manufacturing, in mining, in quarrying, and also um, construction. And it only covers about 20%, 24% of the manpower that, uh, that handles the machineries. But for OSHA 1984, it now covers all economic activities as well as government agencies, except for the armed forces and seafarers. Okay? So now it covers 90% of manpower. If you look at the approach, okay, um, the approach of FMA is, uh, is very prescriptive. It's also very important, uh, dependent on the government. So it's the government who have their own offices, who checks on machineries, and then they're only concerned for the inspection by the regulation authorities. So there are officers that just check and do inspections. So that's just all, that's just, that's it. But for OSHA 1984, uh, you see the importance of self-regulation. Um, the employers have to uh, be responsible and have their own policy. And then uh, OSHA is supported by code of practices and guidelines and regulations. So we have all those regulations under OSHA. And then tripartite responsibility between the employers, employees and the government. So not just, uh, we no longer depend purely on the government. So we have tripartite responsibility. And then worker cooperation and participation is also important. Um, uh, so they have to be responsible also for their safety and health. Uh, if we compare their objectives, the objective of FMA in 1967, it's more focused on the control of the factories and the machines. And then the objective also is uh, for the registration as well as the inspection of that machine. So you see, you have less provision for health. You're more focused on the safety of that machine. So not really on the people or the worker who operates the machines. But OSHA 1984 now focus more on the occupational safety and health of the worker itself and not the machine. So the objective is to safeguard the health as well as the welfare of the employees and not just the employees. It also protects the health and welfare of the people around it. For example, even if you're not working for the uh, for that company, you're merely just a visitor going there uh, for I know for some meeting. You are also protected uh, under the act. And also, if you have contractors, if you have uh, let's say you have cleaning contractors that come in or you have, um, uh, I don't know, some uh, special services contractors that come in to do uh, some specific job in that company. You're also protected under OSHA 1994. Okay. So, uh, so those are, uh, let's see, um, there are other HSE related acts in Malaysia besides the Occupational Safety and Health Act in 1994 and the Factory Machinery Act 1967. Um, in 1984, we also have the Petroleum Safety Measures Act 
and then we also we were also more concerned of the environment so we have the environmental quality act eqa in 1974 so these are hse related acts in malaysia okay um so let's now look uh, a bit deeper on the occupational safety and health act 1984 so it is under the laws of malaysia and it is Act number 514. So what is this OSHA 1994? So OSHA 1994, uh, it starts, it started in 1994 and inside it, it has 15 parts. And then under the 15 parts, there are 67 sections and then there are three schedules in OSHA 1994. So OSHA is applicable throughout Malaysia to all the industries that were specified in the first schedule, which was the industries that we, we, we have gone through just now. All of those are banking and finance and uh, fisheries and restaurants and so on. That's the list of industries in the first schedule. And it's not applicable to people who work on board ships and uh, also, as well as armed forces. Okay, so uh, let's see, in one of the section, in section four, okay, section four uh, uh, gives you the objective of the act. So the objective of OSHA is to secure safety, health, and welfare of persons at work against any risk. And then the, another objective is to protect the persons at a place of work other than persons at work against risk. And then also to promote occupational environment, occupational environment for persons at work, which is adapted to their physiological and psychological needs, and to provide the means whereby the associated occupational safety and health registration may be progressively replaced by system or regulations and approved industry codes of practice to maintain or improve the safety and health standards. Okay, so uh responsibilities to ensure the safety and health at the workplace lies with those who create the risk and with those who work with the risk so everybody has to take part so it's the person who has created a risk as well as people who are working around that risk everybody has to be responsible for the safety and health uh at that workplace so you have to make sure that you are accident free for as long as you can. So what is the concept of OSHA 984? Uh, the concept is accident prevention is an essential part of good management and workmanship. Okay? If you have a good system, that means uh, you have a good management and you have good workmanship. Then you can prevent accident. And again, there should be a co cooperation between management and workers. So that's the concept. And the top management is the one that must take lead. You cannot expect your workers to, uh, to take lead. Okay? The top management is the one who has to start. And then you should have a defined and known safety health policy. So that's what OSHA is all about and organization and resources uh, must achieve that policy. So that's the concept. Okay, so, so under Act number 514, which is OSHA 1984, you have regulations. So that regulations, under the regulations, you have guidelines and codes of practice. That's, uh, so these are the policies uh, of the company. Now, uh, let's look at what are the regulations under OSHA 1994. Okay, so the first regulation is the OSH, Occupational Safety and Health, Employer Safety and Health General Policy Statement. It's the general policy about OSH. And then secondly, there's a CIMA. 
SEMA is control of industrial major accident hazards. So this was uh, it, this is a regulation in 1996. And then there's also the Safety and Health Committee H, uh, SHC regulation in 1996. And then the year after that in 1997, there is the CPL regulation, which is the classification, packaging and labeling of hazardous chemicals. So that that's the regulation for these hazardous chemicals. So you have to be classified, you have to be labeled, you have to be packaged properly. And then number five in uh, 1997, that's the SHO, the regulation to have safety and health officer. And then in the year 2000, there's a regulation, which is the US ECHH, which is use and standards of exposure of chemicals hazards to health. So it talks more about the exposure and the use of hazardous chemicals to the health of the worker. And then in 2004, there is a regulation called the DUPART. So it's a notification of accident, dangerous occurrence, occupational poisoning and occupational diseases. So this is an, uh, it's not just the accident itself, um, but also the uh, the um, near misses, okay? any dangerous occurrence, uh, like occupational poisoning and diseases must also be reported. Now, our guideline. So those are regulations. Okay? Those are regulations. Under OSH, there are also guidelines. So guidelines for public safety and health and construction site management and workers must cooperate. And then there's guidelines on first aid facilities in the workplace. So workplace will have uh, first aid facilities and they should be guideline on how to use it. And then there's guideline for labeling of hazardous chemicals. So remember just now, there was a regulation about the labeling and the packaging of uh, dangerous or uh, hazardous chemicals. So there's and then under that regulation, there's also a guideline on how to do it, on how to label it properly using a, a standard of labeling. And then there's also a guideline for preparation of a chemical register. So if you're going to use chemicals, there's a guideline on how to do it. And the guideline on the control of chemicals that are hazardous to health. So if you remember, you have the chemical, the regulations about the chemicals that's hazardous to health, the, uh, the toxic chemicals, and then there's a guideline on how to follow the regulations. And then guidelines for occupational safety and health in agriculture. Okay, so even in agriculture, they have a guideline on occupational safety and health. So these are examples of guidelines. So there are many more. They meant a lot of guidelines for each and every industry or a sector. Okay. So in section 15 of OSHA, OSHA 984 describes the general duties of employers and self-employed person. So these are the duties of the bosses, okay, what the bosses have to do. So first of all, uh, bosses must ensure as far as it is practical, the safety and health and welfare at, and welfare at the workplace for all of his employees. So he has to make sure that the place is safe. And then the boss must also not just to make sure it's safe, they have to provide and maintain it that way. Maintain a system of work that's so far as practical, uh, practicable, it must be safe and has a minimal risk to the health of the workers. So they have to provide. So they have to ensure the safety, they have to provide the safety and also maintain the safety of the workplace. And also to ensure safety and absence of risk to health in connection with the use or operation or handling on storage and even transportation of the plant and the substances. So it's all about their responsibility on safety. Okay, so more uh, duties of the boss. Uh, the boss, okay, so the employers must provide information 
instruction and training and supervision. So you must provide all this training to the workers. The, boss, boss, the bosses must provide information about their safety policy to the workers. So the bosses must maintain any place of work under the control of the employer or self-employed persons and to provide access to an egress from it that are safe and without such risk. So there must be um, a good access and also exit uh, for the workers uh, to get the information. And then to provide and maintain a working environment that is safe and without, without any risk to the health and it is adequate as regards to the facilities for the workers, uh, the workers' welfare. So what the managers uh, and the workers need is uh, to have more communication between the management and the, uh, see, uh, whoever these are, the workers. Okay. So you have to make sure they know who their workers are. Okay, so that was section 15. And then and section 16 is about the duty to formulate a, a, a safety and health policy. Because you must have a plan, you must have a recovery plan on uh, safety and health. Okay. So it shall be the duty of every employer or a self-employed person. So if you're running your own business, you have to prepare and revise a written statement on safety and health policy. Okay. And then you have to arrange for the time being in force in carrying out the policy and bring the statement and any revision of it to the notice of all of his employees. And then in section 24 talks about the duties of the workers, the duties of the employees. So the workers or the employees have to take care of themselves. They have to take reasonable care of the safety and health of himself as well of the people who may be affected by his work or affected by his absence in, in work. And you have to be uh, responsible for that. You have to take care of yourself as, as well as the people around you. You have to cooperate with the bosses. You have to cooperate, cooperate with the employers and also with your other work colleagues. You have to always wear and use PPE, PPE all the time and to comply with any instructions or measure on OSH. If there's an uh, OSH uh, measurement uh, 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 act or policies, you have to follow it. All right, uh, the Factory and Machinery Act 1964 was actually revised in 1974. Uh, and then uh, it, it's still being referred to and used. So if you look at the contents of the FM, FMA 1967 revised 1974, there are six parts. There are 59 sections, three schedules, and there are also lists of amendments. So that's why that's the uh, revision. And the effective dates, with all the amendments are uh, is uh, was on 1974. So um, the six parts from part one to part six as as follows. So part one uh, is a preliminary, and then part two is about safety, health, and welfare. Part three is the person in charge and certificate of competency. Part four is about notification of accident, dangerous occurrence, and dangerous disease. Uh, so this is the, the Nadu, like the Nadu parts now. And then uh, the notice of occupation of factory and registration and use of machinery is part number five. And the part number six is a uh, is general section. Okay, so the Petroleum Safety Measures Act uh, enacted in 1984 is Act number 302 under laws of Malaysia. So this is the uh, uh, Petroleum Safety Measures Act 1984. So uh, not so thick. So let's see the content of these uh, uh, Petroleum Safety Measures Act 1984. So there are 11 parts and 48 sections, quite a lot, one schedule. 
and there are also a list of amendments. So this act is uh, was made effective on March 1985. So the five parts are uh, preliminary and then part two is transportation of petroleum by road and railway. And then part three is the transportation of petroleum by water. And then part four is the transportation of petroleum by air. And then number four, number five, it is transportation of petroleum by pipelines. Okay. And then part number six up to part number 11. Part number six is storage and handling of petroleum. Part number seven is utilization of equipment gadgets, materials, plants, appliances, buildings, structures, and installations. And then part number eight is the assisting equipment, gadgets, materials, plants, appliances, buildings, structures, and installations. Part number nine is general powers for rectification. Part 10 is liability and part 11 is just a general part. So if you want to read more about it, you can go on to the Ministry of Human Resources under the Department of Occupational Safety and Health, DOSH, and you can read up on the acts. Okay. All right. Um, Petronas have their own procedures and guidelines, and it's called the PPGUA. So Petronas procedures and guidelines for upstream activities is a guideline that they follow and also must be followed by uh, the other operators. Uh, and it has uh, many volumes depending on the type of operations. For example, they have a volume on exploration activities and then there's one on project development. There's a volume on inspection and maintenance of production facilities. And then production operations is also separately discussed in a separate volume. And then this management of health, safety, and environment. Okay. And then this one here shows an example of a uh, PPGUA 3.0 on drilling and well operations is a volume eight. 